The University of Seville, working in collaboration with the Andalusian Institute of Historical Heritage, has conducted an intensive LIDAR survey in a historically compelling area, between the Spanish coastal towns of Capasoto and Sancti Petri. Their goal was to discover the remnants of a long-written-of temple, one dedicated to ancient deities. However, what they discovered instead was an incredibly ancient, once enormous, mass dwelling. Complex, yet intelligently laid out, as if almost akin to modern-day standards of care in regard to sanitation management, food production, and quality of dwelling for its massive population's well-being. A mega-metropolis that, predictably, the academics responsible for its discovery have not only attempted to downplay the find, but also tried to claim it as merely proof of their original temple assertion. Clearly, they are merely backing the tale of events put forth by whomever funded said expedition. From the researchers themselves, quote, The survey area consisted of submerged landscape, seemingly dominated by a series of ancient marshes. Something we feel was most probably intelligently managed farmlands prior to the Great Deluge, which eventually drowned this entire mega-metropolis. Yet I digress. They continued, The study revealed a new ancient coastal landscape, with the presence of moorings, an inland port, and several large, monumental buildings. End quote. By combining data from previous anomalous discoveries, the team created a cross-section of findings, and by a process of elimination, they pinpointed an area in which to scan. Yet, interestingly, after said discoveries of the structures, they quickly and simply delimited the entire area without any further field study or investigation whatsoever. Could this rapid delimitation of the area in regards to the LIDAR scanning possibly be in an attempt to obscure the true enormity of this pre-flood ruin? During their focused investigation, they found rectangular structures some 300 by 150 meters in size. However, these discoveries contradicted their own strictly followed academic accounts of this supposedly legendary temple's whereabouts. This discovery being the mission's objective all along, yet curiously, as mentioned, any further expansion of the LIDAR investigations, academic funding has been stonewalled. Could their reluctance to continue further investigations on a mission which has already clearly cost a lot of funding due to them actually having discovered yet another complexly, intelligently, clearly advanced pre-flood megametropolis? Well, we find said possibilities and the rapid growth of independently owned LiDAR technology incredibly exciting. No other ruins anywhere on our planet is surrounded with more controversy than that of the Great Pyramids of Egypt, or indeed its accompanying plateau. There are many factors to consider when it comes to Egyptology. Within academic fields, there are many no-go areas of study. Although hard work and research within permitted areas has taught us a great deal about the previous 4,000 years of the site's inhabitants. Yet regardless of the most astute academic thesis, there remains three, proverbially, large elephants in the room. When it comes to a full or even a mere fraction of an explanation in regards to the origin of these seemingly impossibly huge pyramids remains patiently absent. No accounts, illustrations of any kind from the era exists. It is simply illogical especially when one considers the sheer feat these structures must have been. We have presented many previous features, polygonal masonry being present on the pyramids. Eroded, yet younger casing stones protecting inner megaliths, clearly of a tremendous age. Salt sediment found encrusting the lower chambers, and so on. Suggesting not only that the pyramids are much older than currently claimed, but were pre-flood ruins. Thus, questions arise. Just how old are the Great Pyramids? In addition to our study of the pyramids, we have also, in the past, asserted that the Sphinx was originally a lion, which, interestingly, correlates to the following hypothesis with fascinating accuracy. 
the Orion theory. The coincidence with pyramids aligned with Orion's belt and other significant constellational positions. Bavall and Hancock support the theory, believing the Great Sphinx was begun in 10,500 BC, creating reference to the constellation of Leo and the orientation of the entire complex with the Nile River and even Milky Way, claimed by them as connected respectively. Zeptepi, using similar methodology, put the age at over 13,000 years. These are clearly astonishing proposals, but the current paradigm for their chronology, we feel, is far too short a time span, and due to our own research, which has uncovered evidence indicative of pre-flood origins, copper tools for such an accomplishment a mere insult to intelligence. Yet, thankfully, due to these various takes on events, their age remains highly contested, and to us, a mystery, which is incredibly compelling. The Lady of Elche, a limestone bust that was first discovered in 1897. It was found at an archaeological site on a private estate, two kilometers south of Elche within Spain, currently exhibited at the National Archaeological Museum in Madrid. The artistic influences involved in creating her are a heavily debated topic. This undoubtedly due to her unusual appearance and the fact that no one seems to be able to pinpoint her origins. According to the Encyclopedia of Religion, the Lady of Elche is believed to have a direct association with Tanit, the goddess of Carthage, who was once worshipped by the Punic Iberians. Though at best, this could be perceived as a guess, based on vague similarity. Clearly, the most striking and intriguing detail surrounding the Lady of Elche is her mysterious and possibly advanced technological appendages. Positioned around her head and flowing down the bust, the original function for these strange decorations is unknown. The current academically accepted view is that the originally polychromed bust is thought to have represented a woman wearing a complex headdress, while some scholars suggest that the sculpture is Iberian and associated with Tanit, the goddess of Carthage, Others have proposed the work reflects a long-lost Atlantean goddess. The unusual features of the sculpture, such as the quietly kept detail that she had an elongated head, has led many independent researchers to suspect the spools were not part of a unique headdress, but was a type of lost technology, reflecting the highly advanced nature of the lost and forgotten Atlantean civilization. Art historian John F. Moffat, along with most of academia, agree that the shape of the lady's eyes, nose, and other features were too delicate to have been carved in pre-Christian Spain. Therefore, predictably, instead of suspecting that an unknown, highly advanced civilization could have possibly created it, many academics have simply concluded it to be an elaborate hoax, regardless of the compelling evidence upon the statue which displays its true antiquity, and also of the fact that in 1997, the mayor of Elche fought to have the bust of the Lady of Elche returned from the National Archaeological Museum of Spain in Madrid to the city of Elche, to be on display during celebrations of the city's 2000th year. It was to be a special exhibit, but the petition to have the bust returned was denied. The director of Elche's archaeological museum, Rafael Ramos, argued that it was preposterous to say that the statue could not survive the journey noting that more delicate pieces are transported around the world regularly. Do these sound like the actions of a group of people who suspect the artifact to be a fake? Or does it sound more like the actions of a group of conspiring individuals with an aim of retaining a valuable, yet largely unknown relic? Is the statue of the Lady of Elche a long-lost Atlantean bust? Or maybe a leader of a group of beings whom once visited Earth? Questions surrounding the Lady of Elche largely remain unanswered. How did she end up in a farmer's field in Spain? The disputes and specialist theories surrounding the Lady of Elche clearly illustrate the secret importance of the bust. Just who was the Lady of Elche? An ancient queen? Perhaps an ancient alien? When a piece is clearly treasured by the same group who contest it as a fake, we always find such objects highly compelling. 
The severe undulating erosion upon the walls of the Sphinx enclosure undoubtedly showed that the Sphinx had been heavily weathered long before the Sahara became a desert. Therefore, one must suspect that it could indeed be over 9,000 years old. Not knowing exactly how much rainfall there's been in the distant past, the Sphinx could indeed be far older than this. The most notable scholarly advocates, Robert Scotch, argues that the Sphinx may be far older than 12,000 years. Robert Baval and Graham Hancock proposed that the Sphinx may have been built around 10,500 BC, during the last age of Leo. Anthony West believes everything on the Giza Plateau testifies to an advanced, secure, and long-settled civilization. Therefore, he suggests that the Sphinx may have been built not during the age of Leo, but a whole processional cycle earlier, in around 36,000 BC, a date he feels is more in keeping with the history of Egypt, as chronicled by certain Egypt kings. Regardless of an exact date, all of these talented Egyptologists propose a date set much further back within history than currently accepted, and they have provided considerable evidence to back up such conclusions. At the time of disclosure, the argument sent shockwaves through the Egyptologist establishment. Not because of the datings, Egyptologists and mainstream historians have grown quite inept at ignoring data, but more because it was realized that there is, indeed, no other explanation for their arguments. There is little doubt that the Sphinx enclosure was subject to severe erosion within its lifetime, and although it could have been explained away as a naturally formed enclosure, we fortunately know from analysis that the limestone blocks dug out from there were then used within the building of nearby Sphinx Temple. Interestingly, no other site in Egypt shows the same type or degree of erosion. Was the evidence hidden away, concealed from the public in what could only be called a conspiracy? Sediments surrounding the base of the monuments and a once existing watermark upon the stones halfway up the Great Pyramid sides indicate just that. Two-inch thick salt incrustations once found within inner chambers, silt sediments rising to 14 feet around the bases of the pyramids, found to contain seashells and fossils that have been radiocarbon dated at nearly 12,000 years old, have indeed slowly vanished over the years. These sediments could only have been deposited in such great quantities by major sea flooding. A watermark was also once clearly visible on the limestone casing stones of the Great Pyramid. These stones were unfortunately unknowingly removed by invading Arabs. These watermarks were halfway up the sides of the pyramid, or about 400 feet above the present level of the Nile River, 200 feet above the base. It seems the last remaining shred of evidence, the enclosure, survived due to the talented individuals that were required to spot it. Individuals who are thankfully on our side. Some of the largest, and indeed oldest, megalithic sites upon Earth are mostly classified as ruins due to them indeed being in a dilapidated state. Yet upon our travels around these so-called ruins, we have often found that erosion is not the primary cause of this current state. Many of those built much later than that of the clearly naturally eroded conditions of Cappadocia, where some sections have literally returned to the geologically natural state in which they were first formed, for example. Instead, they appear to have experienced a cataclysm, one possibly involving a great flood. The crack in the unfinished obelisk, unfinished, like countless other ancient sites, abruptly abandoned ancient quarries, ancient builds, structures, even Moai on Easter Island, abandoned at their seeming height of abilities. These places preserved in a state of past bustling, yet these once flourishing stonemason locations are all now moderately damaged, with only those built to an angle and in anticipation of attack or cataclysm surviving in any real significance a testament to the builders of these sites' abilities and insight, yet further confirmation of an unknown event once occurring. The tallest and oldest of obelisks across the globe often lay toppled as if hit by a wave. Could this reinforce the argument of their indeed once being the Great Deluge? One with enough force to topple these multi-ton monuments worldwide? Menhirs are classified as Neolithic monuments, 
some of which, although rarely discussed, weigh sometimes over a hundred tons. This may indeed be part of the reason they are rarely academically explored. The most spectacular of these being the Loch Maria Cay megaliths, a complex of Neolithic constructions in Loch Maria Cay, Brittany. It comprises of the elaborate tumulus passage grave, a dolmen known as the Table des Marchands, and the most incredible of the ruins, the broken, or more accurately toppled, menhir of Urgra, the largest single block of stone so far known to have ever been transported and erected by Neolithic people. This one rock, like the toppled obelisk of Axum, was of a gigantic size, academically claimed as being quarried and transported by people of primitive nature with Stone Age tools. It is estimated that it weighed over 330 tons when first placed. The question is, like countless other claimed Neolithic ruins, how did they achieve such feats? How did they lift such enormous stones? Were they, like we have posited many times before, the remnants of a once advanced yet destroyed ancient civilization? We find such possibilities, in particular, the men here of Ergra, highly compelling.